Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the International Wagger Syndrome Association's virtual conference, Education, Research, and Support. This is our first virtual conference, and we are truly excited to be here with all of you to enjoy these wonderful presentations. As many as you know, we are the Morris family. I'm Beth, and this is John, and we have two little girls, Miranda, who has Wagger syndrome, and she'll be seven years old in just about two weeks, and Juliet, who just turned five. We're super sad that we aren't seeing everyone in person this year, but as we all know from being parents and caregivers to kids with special needs, not everything goes according to plan, and we have to make adjustments. So this is one of those adjustments. And instead of welcoming everyone in person to Philadelphia, we are sitting here chatting with you from our dining room in the Philadelphia suburbs. And we sincerely hope that you find these presentations informative and we are very much looking forward to seeing everyone in person next year in Philadelphia. As Beth mentioned, although this was not according to plan, the amount of people involved in this event is very exciting. Every year, there are annual Wagger Weekends in the United States, in Japan, and in the UK. For our family, we really appreciate these events as they are the only time each year that we can physically connect with other Wagger families and be around people who just get it. And although we are not actually together today, this global image represents where each of our families who registered for this event come from. With over 150 registrants hailing from over 25 countries connected through this virtual conference. And as our friend and IWSA board member, Tom Cox would say, we've really put the I in the IWSA. So some of you have, may have seen this on our Facebook posts and through emails, but this is our exciting conference agenda for today. Once I am done speaking, I will give way to our executive director, Sherry Krantz, followed by our international board member, Linda Van de Sand, then Madoka Hasegawa of the JWSA, then Dr. Joan Hahn, a pediatric endocrinologist, followed by our own Kelly Trout, then Dr. Vicki Huff from MD Anderson, then Dr. Yana Hall, followed by Dr. Jen Kalish, and last but not least, Dr. Alex Levin. Now I'd also like to extend a thank you to the Delta Gamma Foundation, who graciously awarded us the Service for Sight Grant for this year's US-based Wagger Weekend. And although it was originally for our Philadelphia Wagger Weekend, just like us, they pivoted to support this wonderful virtual event. So a couple last things I wanna talk about in regards to, to housekeeping. One, when you hover over your screen or anywhere above or below where I'm at, you will uh, see a couple of options pop up. One is the Q&A, and I think a lot of you have already found the chat, which is yeah. great. So the Q&A is gonna be the part that we monitor today, and we will address any questions you have uh, for the IWSA or for some of our presenters. And we will really try to address as many as we can. For those questions that we're not able to fully address live during the conference, we will take the best efforts to address those questions and we will respond to you via email afterwards. The chat room is not something that I will be monitoring nor will our speakers. It's merely an opportunity for all of you attendees to connect with each other. Right now within the webinar format, you cannot see each other, but it's a nice opportunity for you to talk to each other. Uh, I have had experiences on webinars where I can't see some people, so I may just say, hey, this is John Hailing from Philly, or hey, this is Tom from North Carolina, or this is Michelle from Germany. And I certainly encourage all of you to do the same. During these presentations as well, as you'll see right now, my face is on your screen. And during certain presentations, depending on what settings you're using through Zoom, the video of the presenter or myself may get in the way of the PowerPoint. 
what you'll often be able to do is hover to the top of it and move that presenter face away from the video. Some last additional reminders is one, we are live streaming on Facebook right now. Pretty exciting. And I really encourage each and every one of you to go onto your Facebook pages and share this. I think our families and friends need to know more about our Wagger syndrome and see more about what the IWSA is about. We are also recording this full presentation and for anyone who registered for it, we will be sending it out via email in the next few days. We also plan to have each presentation individually available on our redesigned wagger.org website in the near future. And then one other thing, at the end of this event, if you'll all be patient with me, I want to try and do something exciting and bold. So right now we're all kind of separated, everyone sees me, but what I'm hoping to do at the end for all of you who can stay on is to make all of you panelists. And if you've ever seen the commercials of those full gallery views with everyone involved, I'd like to do that. For any of you who've gone to Wagger Weekends before, everyone's familiar with doing the really large group photo. Well, we can't all be in person together, but I thought it would be really exciting to get one of those really wonderful gallery shots of all of us. And we're going to attempt to do that at the very end. And lastly, I'd like to thank the IWSA for providing this opportunity to conduct this virtual event. And although a lot of hard work and effort has gone into it, please be patient with us as we navigate through this for the first time. All right, so thankfully I'm done speaking and I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, Shari Krantz, the Executive Director of the IWSA. Shari became the IWSA's first ever staff member in 2017 as the IWSA's first executive director. She has served the IWSA since 2006 when her daughter Amy was diagnosed with Mosaic Wagger syndrome. Sherry has worked with us in a number of roles, including as a volunteer, a board member, a board chairperson, and co-chair. And with Amy and her two grown sons and their families, Sherry has hosted free Wagger weekends in Maryland. Meeting and supporting IWSA families around the world and furthering Wilms Tumor Research are two of her passions. And today she is going to provide us with an overview of IWSA activities. Hello everyone, welcome to our first virtual Wagger Weekend. I'm Sherry Krantz, Executive Director for the IWSA. Life around the world looks very different today and we're all facing significant challenges, many due to COVID-19. In Wagger world, we know these challenges can be overwhelming and frustrating. As an organization, we've had to regroup, cancel meetings and trips, and rethink how we support our families and researchers. How have we addressed the challenges? by creating Wagger Weekend as an online virtual event, expanding our tech options to include Zoom meetings and learning how to host webinars. We've applied for grants and other assistance and we are reducing overall expenses. Last year, things looked quite different than this year. In-person Wagger Weekends were held in the US, UK and in Japan and IWSA representatives attended conferences and meetings. Income in 2019 for the IWSA was 70,000 US dollars. More than half was a result of family fundraising and community awareness events, Wagger Awareness Day and Facebook fundraisers. Generous donations from family foundations like Miranda's Mission and Wagger Warriors, plus our longtime donor, the Esmond Foundation, helped to support our mission. The IWSA nine member volunteer board of directors carefully manages all donations and balance the budget with expenses totaling $68,000. We've highlighted our expenses to align with the IWSA mission of promoting awareness, facilitating research, 
in supporting families. 42% of our 2019 expenses were related to supporting families, which included Wagner weekends. 27% was allocated to organization operations, 21 to research related initiatives, and 11% to awareness. Stewardship and transparency are top priorities for the IWSA Board of Directors. Monthly meetings continue in 2020 as the board navigates the best way to maintain the financial health of the International Wagger Syndrome Association. When we started this year, we had grand plans, then enter COVID-19 and a new reality for all. Income this year is projected to be 25% less than in 2019. The IWSA applied for the U.S. Paycheck Protection Program and we received funds to cover a few months of payroll. We also received a $5,000 grant from the Delta Gamma Foundation Service for Sight Program and special donations from longtime donor, the Esmond Foundation. The IWSA once again has been given top ratings by both GuideStar and great nonprofits. Despite the virus and other current challenges, international activities continue. Linda Van de Sand was appointed as the first international board member and IWSA European representative. The IWSA continues to work closely with Madoka Hasegawa and the Japan Wagger Syndrome Association. We'll hear from both Linda and Madoka shortly. Collaborations with international Aniridia organizations continue, and while in-person meetings are canceled this year, we're staying in touch virtually and maintaining these important relationships. The IWSA is a member of the US-based National Organization of Rare Disorders and the European Organization for Rare Diseases which are both umbrella organizations for rare disease patient groups like ours. The IWSA is also a member of the Global Genes Rare Foundation Alliance, a coalition of more than 600 rare disease organizations. The IWSA mission is very simple and threefold, promote awareness, facilitate research, and support families. We promote awareness worldwide by holding events like this, sharing information and updates through email and on Facebook, holding our Wagger Awareness Day, which is the biggest single fundraiser of the year, hosting a comprehensive and up-to-date website, and producing information sheets that are translated into several languages. Many of our families also participate in Awareness Day events like Rare Disease Day. Wagger Awareness Day this year in November will also be a celebration of the IWSA's 20th anniversary. The second part of our mission is to facilitate research. There are a number of exciting projects underway around the world. In just a minute, we'll hear from Dr. Joan Hahn as well as Kelly Trout and several professionals who will be presenting on research related to Wagger syndrome. Finally, the third portion of our mission is to support families. Membership in the IWSA is free. We currently represent 175 families in 42 countries. Our private Facebook group hosts 260 member parents and caregivers and continues to be a safe platform for parents to connect, share challenges and successes, and be part of a community that understands our unique lives. This year, we have welcomed 10 new families to the group. They each receive a special package containing information, small gift items, and a beautiful handmade quilt by California Wagger mom, Leslie Volk. Welcome packages so far this year have been sent to new families in Ethiopia, Argentina, Norway, Spain, in the UK, and the US. 
We're really excited today to announce that the IWSA's new website is live. This new website is easy to navigate, is accessible, and offers translation options. All of today's presentations and videos will be on the website, as well as updated information, news and events, and information about the IWSA. Please check it out and be sure to let us know what you think. Just like a big family, it takes the talents and skills of many individuals to keep the organization running and moving forward. There are opportunities for volunteers, whether it's hosting a fundraising event, translating information, supporting another family, attending conferences to raise awareness in your community, or applying your skills to an IWSA project. If you're interested in joining the team, please let us know. Thank you to the Morris family for hosting and for shifting from the in-person Wagger weekend scheduled for Philadelphia. John's tech and organization skills have been key to making this all happen. Thank you also to Paul and Nicola Davies from the UK, Linda Van de Sand from Belgium, and Adriana Solorzano from Mexico for helping to package and deliver the conference boxes, which were funded by the generous grant from the Delta Gamma Foundation. And finally, and most importantly, thank you to everyone attending today from around the world. All right, thank you, Sherry, very much. We all appreciate everything you do. And I, for one, am looking forward to working on some of the exciting things that you've discussed. Uh, of note in Sherry's video, she mentioned uh, the new website design. Uh, it is not currently live, although from what I've heard, it, it will be nearing completion very soon. And we anticipate it uh, being ready for everyone to view and visit uh, very early in the fall, hopefully by September. All right, our next speaker, Linda Van de Sand is our first international board member. Today, Linda is going to give an overview of our current activities she is involved in in Europe as the IWSA's European representative. My name is Linda. I'm married to Godwin, a mother to Dylan who is almost four years old. We're a Ghanaian Belgian family. Dylan was born in Ghana, but we moved to Belgium to give him a better future with the best medical care. I graduated as a teacher in art, Dutch language, and later English as a second language. This brought me to teach abroad for seven years. I lived in Kazakhstan, China, and Ghana. After we moved to Belgium, I started working with Red Cross at the shelter for refugees. When I'm not working, I'm mostly occupied with taking Dylan to hospital appointments and keeping up with his health. I also created a Facebook page called Dylan's Wagger Journey to share information and spread awareness. I get involved in awareness campaigns such as Rare Disease Day and Dazzle for Rare. In February, I was nominated for a Patient Advocacy Award from Radioorg, the rare disease organization in Belgium. I started with the IWSA as a volunteer to help out with translations of one-pagers about Wegger syndrome. I look for translators and coordinate the process. I'm joining the IWSA on European visits. In 2018, we visited the Princess Maxima Center of Oncology in the Netherlands to meet with researchers who are working on Wilms tumor research. In 2019, we had a follow-up visit. In 2019, I also became the European representative and first international board member of the IWSA. I am the IWSA contact person for Eurodis, which is the European Organization for Rare Diseases. I made plans to attend the yearly Eurodis conference in Stockholm, Sweden, but couldn't go there due to COVID-19. The same applies to the Aneridia conference in London. I keep an eye out on what's happening in Europe and collaborate and network with other organizations. My main focus is spreading awareness and connecting families internationally. 
A patient with Wagner syndrome is literally a one in a million. As parents, we have to connect with others and join forces to make a difference in the lives of our children. I am doing this to create change, stimulate re possible research, and help to give Dylan and his Wagner friends a better and brighter future. One in a million means it's possible, so those ones need to count. With a lot of small efforts, we can all work together to brighten the future of our children. You can help by translating information sheets or get on board of the fundraising team. No matter what language you speak, we would be glad to have you as part of the IWSA volunteer team. Please get in touch if you are willing to help or want some additional information. All right, thank you, Linda, very much. We appreciate all your efforts, and it's great to have you as part of the IWSA board. Our next speaker is Madoka Hasegawa. Madoka is a board certified anesthesiologist in Japan. She is the founder and president of the Japan Wagger Syndrome Association and a volunteer member of the IWSA. She also supports Japanese families and coordinates annual Wagger weekend events and attends conferences and meetings. Today, she will provide an overview of the efforts taking place in Japan, as well as collaborative efforts taking place internationally. Hello. And I'm gonna share it to you in just a second. Hello, I'm Madoka Hasegawa from Japan. My son Yuri is almost eight and has WGR syndrome. I'm a doctor and I'm working as a board certified anesthesiologist at the General Hospital in Japan. I'm also serving as the president of Japan WGR Syndrome Association, JWSA. I have worked for IWSA as a volunteer also. 18 Japanese families affected by WGL syndrome belong to the JWSA, and some of them are members of IWSA too. Ayana Katsumoto and I are serving as leadership members. We both have good memories when we attended WGL weekend in San Diego together. JWSA has a common mission with IWSA to support families, promote awareness, and stimulate research. We have held the WGR Week in Japan since 2014 every year. On our own website, in our newsletters, and also in our Facebook confidential group, we can find many helpful and knowledgeable resources. Because of this, we are able to keep our communication lines open in the Japanese language. And we have also been busy working to promote and stimulate research and improve our quality of life. We have often attended academic conferences and have made a connection with some researchers. We have also cooperated in the IWSA patient registry project and established the support system for Japanese families to enroll in the registry with Kelly. Through our efforts, we were able to find Professor Toshiyuki Yamamoto. He is one of the leading researchers of genetics and child neurology in Japan. He has worked hard for JWSA and WGR. Thanks to him, WGR was certified as one of the rare diseases which should be supported by a Japanese government in several ways such as providing medical benefits and stimulating research. Last year, Dr. Yamamoto made remarkable progress in launching the patient registry in Japan. This project is supported by a Japanese government grant. In the future, it will lead a further progress of research in Japan and be a great power to strengthen the social support for our families. Now he is trying to get another grant for the research of renal disease of the WGR. 
And one more exciting thing that has happened in Japan is a research project of Eumus tumor of WGR. It has been preceded by Dr. Yasuhiko Kaneko. He is a pediatric oncologist. He has been researching genetics of pediatric cancer with great passion. It has written several medical articles about WGR and Wilmot tumor. We are going to cooperate with both of them to progress the research in Japan. I hope that the IWC patient registry will proceed in the global joint research in the future. And I'd like to find a way that the two registries could collaborate together to develop an effective treatment. Because the number of WGR patients is so few, our international sharing experiences are priceless. And like the achievement of IWSA, which have supported us, we, JWSA, can also be helpful to families all around the world. We have one common mission to encourage and progress together. For all practical purposes, we realize the achievement by families and worldwide social policy. Both is important to improve our lives all over the world. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madoka, very much. And although I have not met you yet, I want to thank you for working tirelessly to promote awareness and facilitate research in Japan. Taking another look at our agenda, our next speaker will be Dr. Joan Han. The IWSA relationship with Dr. Han began in 2005 when she started Wagger syndrome studies at the National Institute of Health. Dr. Han is the director of the Pediatric Obesity Program at Leigh Bonner Children's Hospital at the University of Tennessee's Health Science Center. Today, Dr. Han has graciously agreed to provide an overview of her findings from the NIH study, and there will also be an opportunity for her to answer some of your questions at the end of her presentation. As a reminder, if you do have questions for Dr. Han, please be sure to type them into the Q&A, and we will get to as many as we can. Now, if you'll kindly give me a moment, I am going to attempt to pull Dr. Han into uh, the presentation as a panelist. I just have to find her because there's so many people on here, which is so exciting. There we go. So Joan, I hope you're ready. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I really appreciate you coming on board. We're so excited. Really exciting. Um, I'm going to give an attempt to share my screens. Let's see if this works. Let me know if you need any help. And Joan, I, while you're working on that, I just want to mention to everyone that I had the opportunity to listen to your talk two years ago at the Wilms Tumor Summit. Um, and I really can't thank you enough for your efforts. I think it really blew away all the physicians, researchers, and, and I know for sure our families. See, I apologize because um, what happened was I had a PC and then it, the battery basically um, caught on fire. <laughs> so I switched over to my son's Mac and I'm trying to figure out how to, to use this. Um, okay, I think this might be correct. Okay, so I'm going to do share screen mm -hmm. and then I'm going to choose this and share. All right. Perfect. Can y'all see that? Okay, and what I did is I also created subtitles at the bottom to make it a little bit easier to understand Perfect. in case there's um, uh, in, in, you know, sort of audio impairments. Um, can you see the subtitles as well as the slides? Yep, and I'm going to take myself out of this too. So. Oh, okay, great. And then what I'll do is I'll minimize to, to this. Okay, great. 
All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I've been to past uh, Wagger Weekends in person and they were truly the most fun events um, and, and my family enjoyed it so much too. So I hope that once um, this whole COVID situation resolves that we, we can get together in person soon. Um, so this is a um, update on uh, the talk that I gave at the PCORI meeting two years ago and I distilled it down to 12 minutes, hopefully, <laughs> um, of, the, of the key parts that I think would be um, helpful. Um, and so uh, the subtitle for my talk is actually, uh, I can, oops, how do I need next screen? Sorry, I'm still learning how to do this. Um, hmm. So slide advancement, what do you think? Is it, ah, here we go. Okay, so I can use the dial. All right, so I subtitled um, this families and researchers working together to improve clinical outcomes is how to train your dragon. And um, the reason is because uh, these movies and TV program are, are my family's, uh, one of our favorites. And I think it's because it really talks a lot about how when, um, when working together, there's synergy and you can do so much more by working together. Um, and so I thought that would be a fitting subtitle uh, for my talk. Uh, I'd like to share uh, the work that um, was conducted um, between the years of 2016 and, and about 2014 at the NIH and then continued after I left and went to Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and the, the focus really is on you know, what we found there and kind of you know, the future directions that we'd be going um, because of the research. Um, so the, the concern that I had when I was a fellow um, was to you know, pick a research topic in which we could learn about um, genetic disorders and use that to um, design new treatments to help people with rare disorders as well as um, using kind of rare disorders as an example to treat more common um, conditions that are in the general population. And so Wagner syndrome, despite it being very rare, um, can teach us so much about genes that are you know, really important just for the rest of the population. And so I think that we can all work together to improve health for all people um, through our research studies. Um, as you all know, the WAGR is an acronym. The W is for Wilms tumor, A for aniridia, G for GU anomalies, and R for range of developmental delays. Um, and the cause of this is heterozygous deletions on chromosome 11. So everybody has two copies of genes, one from mom, one from dad. And so if one of the two copies is affected, then you have heterozygous, meaning one of two um, uh, or have the deletion. And the cause for the Wilms tumor and the GU anomalies is a loss of one copy of WT1. Aniridia is caused by loss of PAC6. But at the time when I started studying Wagner syndrome back in 2006, we really didn't know what the cause of the range of developmental delays are. What we did know though, was that there are some additional features when children have bigger deletions that include a gene called EXT2 that they can get osteochondromas, which are tumors of the bone. And furthermore, if it's an even bigger deletion and it has ALX4 uh, deleted, then you get holes in the skull called parietal foramina. And so kind of looking in the other direction, there's a gene that lives up here, which we kind of wondered, maybe this gene, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, might be the gene that causes the excess hunger and obesity that is seen in some, but not all patients, as well as impaired pain perceptions. There's really high pain tolerance that some of the parents were reporting in children. And why is it that BDNF was you know, kind of on our radar? Well, the reason is because um, about a decade earlier, um, so back in the 1990s, um, people had looked at mice that had BDNF deletion. Um, and so this is a, um, a BDNF a mouse that has one copy of BDNF deleted and then a wild type litter mate, meaning that um, it's a normal genetic type um, brother. And you can see there's a big difference in body weight. And so there was overeating or hyperphagia in the mice as well as obesity. And then these mice also had reduced sensitivity to pain and they had impairment in their social interactions, learning and memory. And so because of this cluster of uh, symptoms the mice were showing, um, it made us wonder if perhaps this might be you know, important in people, that maybe it's in people also the BDNF deletion is causing obesity and neurocognitive impairments. So to study this, um, we conducted a study at the National Institutes of Health. And our main focus was on BDNF, but we also figured since you know, people are coming, we should look at everything else too. We should look at all the other genes that are in this region and see if there are additional phenotype, which means the symptoms, genotype, which means which genes are deleted, correlation um, in this region. 
And so in order to do this, um, I am so touched and grateful by the time, effort, and sacrifice that families and patients um, donate to us by coming to the NIH. And you can see that the rigorous schedule that they had to go through for an entire week, it was just packed and packed with testing that they had to do. And so um, I, I just can't even, words just cannot even express how grateful I am um, that for the sake of, of improving medicine and, and research knowledge that uh, families gave of themselves to do this. Um, just truly heroic. So now I'm going to share what we uh, learned from these studies. Um, I'll start with BDNF since that was our you know, kind of main focus. Um, so what we did was we categorized children um, based on uh, whether they had intact BDNF, and I'm using the plus plus symbol to represent that both um, alleles or genes are, are present. And then plus minus means one copy is missing. So that's heterozygous or haploinsufficiency for, for BDNF. And you can see that you know, across the lifespan that there's a significant difference in um, body weight you know, between those with and without um, BDNF loss. And so if you look at uh, development of childhood obesity, so the yellow bar represents those with um, loss of BDNF, that 100% of children by age 10 would develop obesity, um, whereas those who had intact BNF essentially had the same level of obesity as you know, just kind of background prevalence of obesity in the United States, which is about 18%. Um, so this you know, kind of hinted to us that without um, you know, nutrition and lifestyle intervention, um, that there's a great propensity for um, developing obesity if you have BDNF loss. So when you think about the energy balance equation, there's kind of two parts. There's um, how much you eat, that's calories in, and how much energy you spend, that's calories out. So we looked at um, hunger um, in, in the patients, and it turns out that the hyperphagia or the hunger score is higher in people with uh, loss of BDNF. So that would um, hint that you know, it's really an intake um, that, you know, of calories that's driving the weight gain. We also um, did resting energy expenditures. That's looking at your basal metabolic rate. And we identified that there was no difference. So in other words, there isn't um, you know, kind of like a slowed metabolism to explain um, the energy imbalance, but rather it's really energy intake. And so this kind of fits with the mouse studies because in mice, um, if you were to take a mouse that has BDNF deletion and you pair feed it, meaning you allow to eat only as much food as its wild type or normal genotype um, brother, uh, then you can actually prevent the obesity. So by simply you know, making sure that the right amount of food is consumed, um, that you can you know, sort of circumvent the hyperphagia uh, because there isn't like a problem with you know, resting metabolic rate or energy expenditure. And so that's its intake that drives the obesity. And so then that gives a clue for how we might be able to prevent or treat obesity in people with Wagner syndrome. So the other symptom I shared with you about is that mice um, have decreased sensitivity to pain. So we wanted to look at this in people as well. So we asked the children who are holding this little electrode in their hand that changes temperatures, so either really hot temperatures or really cold temperatures, to rate whether or not it caused uh, pain or discomfort. And you can see that the yellow bars, which represents um, BDNF deletion, you can see the scores are lower than the blue bars, which is intact BDNF. So that means that across all the different temperatures, hot or cold pain, um, is perceived as less painful in people who have BDNF loss. We also looked at um, cognitive function, and that's through IQ testing and adaptive behavior, which is using the Vinalin. And you can see that there are lower scores um, for both cognitive function and adaptive behavior if you have BDNF loss. We also looked at uh, social interactions and um, autism symptoms. And so it turns out that if you kind of divide up the components of the three classic features of autism, which are social impairments, communication impairments, and repetitive behaviors, that it's really the social impairments that seem to kind of stand out um, in those who have BDNF loss. And because of that, there's a higher rate of meeting criteria for autism spectrum disorder when you use a questionnaire. So the ADI is a questionnaire um, that is given. What's interesting though, is if you then have children come in and actually meet with a expert child neuropsychologist, um, and that, that is actually done um, in addition to interviews, it's actually observing. So the, it's a, the O of ADOS stands for observation. And so that's when the child psychologist actually you know, plays with a child and really sees how play and interactions happen. And when they do that, they actually find that really loss of BDNF isn't associated necessarily with full-blown um, autism, 
Um, and this seems to suggest then that maybe if you're using just questionnaires to diagnose autism, you may overdiagnose autism spectrum disorder because cognitive and visual impairments may um, cause some of the same symptoms and kind of be confused um, for autism. Now, this becomes important in the context of research, um, meaning that you know, we want to tease out what really is autism versus not. But for families, what we've often told them is that if your child has a diagnosis of autism and it allows for the child to get special services at school um, and other therapies, um, by all means, please you know, hang on to the, the, the label. Because sometimes the label, even if it's not really capturing the true essence of the diagnosis, it, it actually can still be beneficial. And so I think that's where you have to kind of tease out the difference between between research versus clinical um, care. So uh, because of these findings um, of the role of BDNF in both um, sort of pain, cognitive function, and um, eating, um, we now have some ongoing studies. Um, we're looking at how um, since everybody has one copy of BDNF left that's normal, it's only one that is deleted, what can we do about the remaining copy? Can we enhance it? Because there's some data to suggest that different types of exercises, different types of diets, and even the timing of meals, so having um, periods of, um, of not eating uh, during the daytime, so not like you know, long periods of fasting, but rather um, you know, choosing to have you know, eating only when the sun is up and not eating when you know, it's nighttime um, can make a difference in how BDNF levels fluctuate in the blood for um, typical people. And so the question is whether or not when you have one copy lost can the remaining copy respond in the same way? And so we're kind of looking at that. We also have mice um, in whom we're testing various different oral medications to induce weight loss. And then right now, the sort of exciting thing that we're working on is um, some of you may have heard of the CRISPR-Cas9 you know, technologies that are very exciting for gene therapies. And so we're trying to figure out ways to deliver gene therapy directly into the specific brain regions that control appetite so that we can get improvements in appetite without causing problems such as, you know, inducing excess pain or, you know, features that we don't want. So we want to have really specific treatments that don't cause side effects. Okay, so now moving along to some of the other genes, um, even though BDNF was our focus, we were interested in, you know, kind of opening up, you know, our, um, you know, palette to look at uh, other things while we were doing the study. So PAC6 haploinsufficiency, our deletion, um, uh, was already known to, to have a role in brain and pancreas development. So that part wasn't new. But what we did find that was new and kind of interesting is that when we were doing the brain imaging, um, we noticed that in um, children who are healthy um, and have normal PAC6, um, they have a normal looking pineal gland in the, in the brain. Whereas in people with PAC6 loss, it's not there. You don't see that little bump there. And so, this particular part of the brain is important for making melatonin. And you may have heard of melatonin. It's available over the counter, in fact, as a sleep aid. And so people who have um, smaller pineal glands and who have loss of PAC6, they tend to have greater sleep disturbances. Um, so one of, the, um, uh, one of my graduate students um, who, who uh, went on to, to be a, a professor elsewhere is you know, starting to look at this you know, in her research to try to see if melatonin can be helpful. Um, another gene that we started looking at was C11 or 46. Um, so this is a gene that is important in chromatin remodeling. So that's in how um, our, our DNA is wrapped around different proteins and it controls their expression. Um, and so we found that if you have loss of PAC6, your corpus callosum, so that's the middle part of the brain that connects the two halves, the right and the left, that that part is smaller, um, but it gets even smaller if you also have C11 or 46 deleted. And so I think a picture probably shows this a little bit better. So these are in children and these are in adults. You can see that um, this is a normal corpus callosum. Um, this is an image of the brain if it were, you know, kind of sliced down the middle, you know, uh, in between your eyes going kind of straight back. And you can see that it, it looks smaller. This little white band is smaller in PAC6 loss, but if you have PAC6 and C11 or if you can see it's much, much thinner and, and even the shape of it is starting to, to change. And so the right and left halves of the brain have to talk to each other. They have to communicate. And this connection between the right and left brain by the corpus callosum is important, particularly for things like auditory processing. So if you have disrupted interhemispheric connectivity, then you can develop auditory processing disorders. Um, what is that? So auditory processing is if, um, let's say I'm like in a, in a restaurant and it's really noisy and loud, but the person next to me is talking to me. Well, I'm able to filter it out. Like I can tell, okay, this is signal. Signal is my friend talking. Um, and then background noise is noise. You know, I'm gonna filter that out. 
or in a classroom, if a teacher is talking, but the kid next to me is like kicking my chair and like making sounds and doing things, can I filter out those annoying sounds and still listen to the teacher? So it's that kind of ability. It's sort of hearing something different in the right and left ear and choosing which one you want to pick. So it turns out that in people who have PAC6 loss, there's actually, that's aniridia by itself, that you know, there's a quite a very prevalent auditory processing disorder, but there's even more. So double that if you have Wagner syndrome, because people with Wagner syndrome tend to have additional genes to lead, including C11 or 46. So I think that this points to how um, having additional genes affected can cause symptoms that would be really important to know in terms of helping children in school. So what are some other findings? So going beyond the corpus callosum, we were interested in looking at just all the regions of the brain and to see if there may be um, you know, some clues for the different genes on chromosome 11 and how it, it you know, affects the morphology of the brain or the shape of the brain. So this is surface morphology on the outside and on the inside of the brain. And the different colors are telling you red is that it's a little bit smaller or different from um, typical uh, brain development. And blue is actually that it's a little bit Bigger. So there are like some things that may be bigger or smaller or, um, you know, just variant compared to um, in terms of the surface uh, compared to um, typical uh, developing children. And so I think that that gives us clues for how all the different genes um, may be affected. So this is ongoing research that, you know, we haven't finalized yet, but we're still studying. So one of the things we noticed is that if you look at the adult height, which is plot on the y-axis here, compared to the size of the deletion on the x-axis, you can see that the bigger your deletion, the smaller your height is going to be as an adult. And in fact, for you know, every sort of one million base pairs or one mega uh, base you know, uh, deletion increase, you also lose about a centimeter or you know, about a half an inch or so of height. Um, so that means that there may be a lot of different genes along uh, chromosome 11 that are important for stature. And so those are some things that we're also exploring. Um, there were also some patients who had some um, craniofacial abnormalities, such as a narrow uh, palate and kind of a flattened face and a flattened um, kind of neck structure, which uh, can put you at risk for obstructive sleep apnea when you're lying down to sleep. Um, and so these are some things that our dental and craniofacial colleagues are interested in kind of following up on in terms of looking at whether or not using dental appliances when children are developing um, sort of uh, between ages six and 12, if wearing like a night guard it might, at night might be able to expand the palate or help with these things to prevent uh, breathing issues or speech uh, issues later on um, in, in adolescence and adulthood. Um, we also found that WT1 um, is very important um, in uh, development of um, uh, sex organs. And so basically, um, it was already known that WT1 has a role in Mullerian duct remnant um, uh, degeneration as part of normal development. So people start off as female as default. So in other words, if, if your genes don't turn on and do different things, uh, by default, uh, a baby will be female. And so the only way for, for you to have a male um, uh, child, uh, a boy, is for various different genes to turn on during pregnancy that will cause all the female structures to regress and for male structures to develop. And WT1 is one of the genes that's important for that. And I think for us, what was helpful was um, identifying how this might be important in Wagner syndrome in terms of things to look for in terms of symptoms. So this is a boy. Um, you can tell it's a boy because um, there is a, a penis here. You can see in this in this MRI picture. And what happened was this boy was having recurrent urinary tract infections. And we were trying to figure out why, because, you know, it just didn't quite make sense because boys tend not to get a lot of urinary tract infections, you know, if everything is normal on the inside. So when we looked on the inside, what we found was that here's the bladder. And then behind the bladder was this structure um, that is exactly where in a female, a uh, uterus would normally would be. And this, this pouch was actually connected to the same tube that leaves the, the bladder to, to make urine. And so what was going on was because the, the, the uh, bladder-like structure, which we call a Mullerian duct remnant, never went away, uh, there was this extra pouch for urine to back up into and to develop sludge and cause infection and problems. And so, um, you know, it was advised that, you know, the, the, the patient undergo surgery to remove this pouch that was a nidus for infection. Um, so uh, that kind of summarizes uh, the studies um, results from, from the phenotype-genotype correlation studies. And we're still doing you know, studies, as, as I mentioned, to look for treatments for these conditions. Uh, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit just to talk about how it was so important for us to work with IWSA to, to design the study and think about how to make it work and to be able to recruit patients to participate and to stay in the study. 
Um, and then we had to make revisions to the studies that went along from feedback from families. And it was through the IWSA also that we were able to disseminate findings kind of in the way that I'm, I'm doing now is to share with you what we learned. So it's like a full um, circle in terms of communication. So the very first time I met anybody with Marker syndrome was in 2006. I get to, got to meet Caroline and Irma um, when they came to visit the NIH and uh, they brought with them this adorable, colorful rainbow zebra, which my kids love. Um, so it's really special to me thinking back to our first meeting. And um, during the years that you know, we worked together, we realized we had to make some adjustments. So for example, some of our testing had this really big um, lunch buffet that had tons of different things for people to choose from to test appetite. But then it turns out that was just really hard for kids to do. So we got feedback from people and switched it over to a single food item test so that kids with visual impairment and you know, sort of um, you know, be, being able to feed themselves and reach for things. Um, so that's what was a feedback that was helpful. Um, one thing that was, um, of great concern to us was that um, we learned uh, that you can have an adverse reaction to propofol, particularly if you have high baseline triglycerides as a risk factor for pancreatitis in of itself, but adding propofol on top of it because propofol contains a soybean oil emulsion, because if anyone's seen propofol, it's like this white milky um, liquid, um, is that it really bumps up the triglycerides. So if you already have a predisposition for pancreatitis to your high triglycerides, this is something that really should not be used. Um, and this is something that we learned, unfortunately, the hard way. Um, so it was, that was one of the, the most difficult parts of the, of the whole study was, was when this happened. Um, but my hope is that sometimes when these kinds of things happen, that we can learn in a way that helps other patients. Um, and so now we advise people to you know, check baseline amylase lipase and triglycerides before a, uh, any type of sedation procedure that might involve propofol and to avoid propofol if there is baseline high triglycerides. Um, we also learned a lot from our rehabilitation uh, consultations while patients were at the NIH. So we had an occupational therapist with low vision expertise. And I would recommend uh, for anyone who's having OT therapies to please ask for somebody with low vision expertise because you can learn so much from them that um, just typical OT folks may not have had training on. And so they were able to provide all kinds of adaptive devices that were helpful. And our audiology support staff was incredible in helping in particular with the auditory processing disorders. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that. So this is, was really informative to me. This is called a paley robson contrast chart. So I myself, um, if I stare at the screen, I can see to here. So I can read the letters all the way down to here. Um, the occupational therapist told me that the typical child with Wagner syndrome or aniridia actually can only see to maybe about here or so at best. And so that was really eye-opening for me um, because, you know, like, if I can easily see down here, but someone else can only see there, that, that's a really different thing. And so um, they then pointed out that a lot of schools like to use, you know, those light paper, you know, that's a little bit like recycled. It's a little bit gray and it has light blue lines, or they'll use light blue paper with white lines. And you can see, I can see the lines, but if, a, you know, a child who cannot see contrast looks at this, of course, they're going to write like all over the place. And so I had a lot of families, you know, tell me, oh, you know, in school, like the handwriting is just completely out of control and it's not, you know, where it needs to be. Well, maybe it's because you can't see the lines and that's why you're not writing on the lines. And so the advice that the occupational therapist gave was that you should tell all the schools, please only use this kind of really, really bold black and white for you know, people to write on because otherwise you can't be possibly expected to write on the line if you can't see it. Also for some patients, they were having significant glare, um, particularly with corneal um, concerns and, um, and, and with the anoridia itself, you know, letting a lot of light in, that yellow uh, lenses that were tinted um, on you know, sort of glasses can be helpful not only for contrast, but also for reducing glare. And so that was something that, you know, the occupational therapist shared with us, which I thought was helpful. Um, in terms of increasing self-care and independence, um, uh, she recommended using these coily um, shoelaces um, so that basically you thread them in through the, the holes and then you pull it to tighten and it snaps back because the coil will, will stop it from um, pulling all the way through. And so that way you don't have to necessarily tie your shoelaces, but you still have the options of wearing shoes that are not Velcro. Because really, you know, in the teenagers or older kids, you know, Velcro options really, you know, limit, you know, the, the array of shoes you can pick from. And so I think that this allows, you know, for you to, to pick other shoes, um, but still be able to tie your own shoes. Um, she also provided these plates that have edges to them and also special um, grippers. So like it's a spoon that actually Velcros onto around your, the palm of your hand and has a 
bent uh, angle to the fork and the, and the um, spoon. Um, and so then that way it's a lot easier to be able to feed yourself. I don't have a picture of the rocker um, knife, but she also provided a knife that looked like um, it was a blunt edge knife that was on a handle so that you could cut food much more easily. Cause it's really hard to, you know, hold a, a knife to cut it this way, but if you can rock it, then you can use a rocker knife to be able to, to cut your food yourself. So that helped. She taught a bunch of kids, you know, how to do this. And they, they really felt that they were able to achieve more independence of meals because of that. And then our um, audiology friends um, showed us these FM devices. So the way this works is the child wears an earpiece and, and then places a microphone near the teacher. And what happens then is it transmits the voice of the teacher so it's louder than the background noise. So that helps with the, the signal to noise ratio. Also, it's really important for the kids to be at the front of the classroom. So that way they can have a little bit more focused attention and also kind of avoid, you know, how the back of the classroom can get a little noisier and a little more disruptive. And so trying to avoid that background noise can help with the auditory processing to be able to learn. Of course, now with, you know, COVID, you know, I think one of the things that we're sort of realizing is, uh, at least when my kids were doing sort of Zoom classes, is that they don't mute all the kids and everyone's talking. It is, you know, no one can hear anything. And so I think that giving feedback to teachers to make sure to only have the one person who's teaching on and everyone else needs to be muted is really critical because otherwise there's just no way to focus. I mean, I think all of us would struggle with that. Um, so we learned a lot from this. You know, we learned that uh, family perspectives are really important. Um, for example, um, we start to hear families talking about how a lot of their kids seem to be, you know, kind of experiencing clumsiness because they would like bump into objects, especially on their sides, at their peripheries. And, you know, they would repeatedly express this to, you know, care providers and be told, oh, well, it's just visual impairments or maybe neurocognitive deficits. But then when you like ask a little more specifically, you hear from the kids that, it's because they have double vision unless they turn their head to the side. So that, that actually sounds like something a little more than just overall vision uh, decrease. And so what we found out was that some kids actually, when you ask them to gaze, so um, um, in this young man, we asked him to please gaze this way. And you can see that this eye moves toward the you know, center like it's supposed to, but this eye got stuck. It never went all the way to the edge. So there was a problem with lateral gaze or sideways gazing. And what can cause this? Well, the, the uh, cranial nerve six is the one that's responsible for this. It's called the abducens nerve. And so um, the one on the, this side here looks perfectly fine. It's right there like it's supposed to be. And that's why the side moves just fine. But this one, you don't see any little black dot to represent where that nerve should be. And so in the absence of that, that's why the eye wasn't able to move all the way over. So this is really important to know because now we understand it's not clumsiness. It's actually a visual impairment. And so it requires, you know, understanding that, um, you know, the periphery, you know, can be dangerous unless you're cautious to make sure that we don't, you know, have accidents or problems because we don't look to the side. So it is a, an important awareness to have. Um, the other thing we learned, um, and this is alluding back to the autism diagnosis thing I was mentioning before, is that what researchers want, those priorities may not always be the same as what families want. And we've got to align this by talking because maybe the researchers are like really, really focused on trying to like be really precise about the diagnosis of autism-like features versus true autism. So our neuropsychologists were writing this out in gory detail in their notes. And then we had to realize that we had to be careful because these are research notes. And if this gets back into the regular medical chart of the child back home, it's possible that you might actually lose social services if you don't have an autism label. So we actually revised the way we do things and we started to seclude, you know, what was research and what was clinical. And so we changed it. So we actually had our neuropsychologists try to like start to word things differently, like would benefit from uh, services because of these autism features and things like this. And that's incredibly important because we obviously don't want anyone to you know, to, to have reduced services because of a diagnosis being removed. Um, so this is why communication is really important. And that's why, you know, having kind of a, a clear distinction between what's clinical and what's research is also, you know, just a, a really important part of research. Um, and then this is my last slide. It's basically to, to show that we learned that since Wagner syndrome affects essentially every organ system of the body from head to toe, that nobody can be, you know, an expert at, ev at everything. So we had to collaborate with so many other um, experts and we had to collaborate with families because ultimately the real experts are the parents. It's the parents of children who can share with us symptoms and things that we never even thought to ask about. And so this is why collaboration is really, really the only way or the way of the future really to, to make a difference in, in, in promoting um, medical advancement. And so along those lines, I have to say thank you to all of the research team and collaborators who made the um, studies possible and are continuing to collaborate with me to this day. 
And then an extra special thank you to the families who joined our research studies. Um, and then for anyone who would like uh, the link to the, the 60 minute presentation that was you know, done in 2018, I updated a little bit for 2020 data. data um, this talk was just extracted from that to make it shorter, but if you wanna hear the whole thing, it's here. And it will also be available on the IWSA website. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Han. Uh, it looks like we have a list of about eight questions. Um, I don't know how much time you have, but the first one, a mother is asking her 22-month-old uh, daughter, uh, who's 20 pounds, 29 inches tall, has had a very slow rate of growth of her teeth. Uh, mm -hmm. the, her daughter has 10 currently, uh, and is this a common thing seen in, in Wagger children? Uh, and she reports that she does have her BDNF gene, but is missing 46, 46 other genes on chromosome 11. Yeah, so um, the way we think about teeth is um, in the same way um, as kind of global skeletal bone age development. So I think that um, if, if this is of concern, you know, it would be to, you know, to, to follow up, uh, you know, and I have to apologize, I, I'd have to pull out my growth chart right now to actually plot, like, did, can she mention what the percentiles are? Otherwise, I can, I can pull out my book and actually see what percentile the height and the weight are. Um, I don't, no. I don't know. Oh, so there's, okay, hold on. Actually, I think I can even pull up the question. The person who put the question in, they can add another comment. Let me see if I can do this. Let me pull up the question. Okay. Well, at least I can look, because it's easier when I read a question than to, uh, okay, so 20 pounds at 22 months. Let me, let, I can just quickly look it up if that's okay. And how much time uh, actually do I have? Because I don't want to take up, I, I have all day, but I don't want to take up all of your time. Um, um, I so I just quickly. do about five minutes of Q&A, and then certainly I can forward any of these additional questions to you. Um, oh, okay. All right. So it looks like she already answered the question. Okay. So the weight is third percentile and the height is, what would you say was below? It's, it's not on the chart because it's well below the, the, the 29 inches tall. Okay. No, she was typing in the percentiles because, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Correct. Okay. All right. So, um, so in general, um, delayed um, bone ages, which is, you know, skeletal development and tooth development, um, happens when people are, you know, below the curves. Because what happens is your, your body tends to be more like, if you were to take the height and the weight and kind of plot it and say, what's that, what is that average? Um, then, you know, because so 20 pounds is probably, you know, closer to like a 12 month old, I think. Um, so, so it could be that it's, it, the body is kind of readjusting based on size. Um, so if growth is of concern, um, which I, I think this is, um, I would recommend highly that an endocrinologist um, evaluate Ruby to make sure that there isn't like, for example, growth hormone deficiency or some other type of reason for why. Another very common cause for poor growth, which is completely unrelated to Wagner syndrome, but we see a lot in the population is celiac disease. And so celiac disease, which is a wheat allergy to gluten, portion of wheat, you know, can also cause people not to, to grow and not to gain weight and to have a very delayed bone age. Um, so those would be, you know, the kinds of things that I would be concerned about because in general in, in Wagner syndrome, we see that, um, you know, the height is shorter, but it's not, you know, like a profound, you know, um, growth uh, impairment. And so I think, you know, without having, you know, met your daughter, or actually examined her, you know, I would just want to say, you know, I would want to rule out just making sure there isn't any other health problem that's inf interfering with her in her growth. Um, and it looks like, um, okay, so she'll be having a bone age uh, in about two months. Um, okay. And then, uh, so since it goes to 11P12, just make sure the EXT2 and ALX4 are not affected because if they are affected, that could also explain some of the things because those are involved, as I showed you in the first slide, with bone development. So that would need to be checked. So just look for ALX4 and um, EXT2 on the report because 11P12 is the region where those genes are, but that's kind of like a zip code. It's not an address. So you need to look at the address to like figure out exactly. So I can tell you you're in the zip code where that might be a problem, but it's not necessarily the gene. I don't know because I don't know the address. Okay. The address is like the, the, the numbers, like there's like a million, it's like you know, 20, 29,354,000. When you look at the report, it has that. That's the address. Okay. And then the next question was the BDNF deletion, uh, will that likely cause significant behavioral issues? Yes, it can. Um, you know, so with all things, there's never 100%. It's always called predisposition. So there's a greater predisposition for behaviors. Um, so some of the social impairments can include aggressive behavior. So in the mice, uh, we actually have to individually house them because otherwise the mice will fight. 
um, in people, um, the aggressive behaviors are oftentimes not continuous. Oftentimes they may be related to being denied food because if you're, you know, if someone wants something and they don't get it, then they have a meltdown, but the meltdown becomes even more severe than what you would typically expect. So um, it, the, way, the way we've talked about how to help that is that if you change the way you think about food, and make it so that you no longer eat food because you're hungry, but you eat food because it's a certain time. So you actually change it so it's a schedule and not based on feelings. So in other words, if you know for a fact that you know, you're gonna have breakfast you know, at, uh, I'm just gonna throw out some time. So if you know it's breakfast at eight, you know, um, snack at 10 and lunch is at 12, basically it helps structure the day so that there's no question or fear or concern about when my next meal is. And instead of focusing on where's my food, where's my food, it's um, I'm going to count down the minutes. And so by looking at the clock and counting down the minutes, you can actually still at least do other activities because you're not so worried about when you're going to get um, your next meal. So that can help with the food and the meltdown and anger kind of aspect of it to regiment it. Um, there's also an importance to have a routine. So when I mentioned about the autism-like symptoms that go along with eating enough, breaking someone's routine is just really hard. You know, I think all of us, we're, we're creatures of routine, but for people who have beating enough loss, it's even more so. Like if you're used to doing something a certain way every single day at a certain time in a certain order, if you suddenly disrupt that, that can be really, really difficult to adjust to. And so trying to avoid that kind of preemptively will avoid some of the uh, behavior issues. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, another um, Wagger mom asked if her child can have um, BDNF loss and not be overweight. Uh, she's reporting that her son has a high tolerance for pain and significant delays, but he's not overweight at all. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you know, I think the classic example of this is another genetic condition called prader willi syndrome. So the average kid now with prader willi syndrome is not overweight. And the reason is because we are now more aware about healthy eating and we have a very different way of thinking about food and exercise. So it's, it is preventable, you know, so I think that um, there's not a hundred percent guaranteed, um, you know, when we did the study, no one knew that BDNF was causing that. So people weren't really as cautious. So now people are more aware that there's a risk in Wagner syndrome of increased weight. So yes, I think that if, because, you know, in a person's home that, you know, the, the type of food and the access to food is, you know, uh, mostly healthy options and that there's regulation of that, you can have that part not even be an issue. And on the other hand, all the other features might be there. So some of the um, high pain tolerance and perhaps, you know, maybe some subtle uh, social or interactive kind of differences might be noticeable, but not have the, the, the obesity portion of it. Okay, great. Now I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because I want to be respectful to your time. Um, in general, what percentage of Wagger patients are deleted for BDNF? And then for those families on here who are unsure, um, how can they find out if that del deletion is, is there? Um, so, so far in the studies that we've done, it's about two thirds. Although what happened was we went and kind of did, um, you know, we contacted different uh, genetic groups who do a testing for just deletions in general. And it turns out that there are a lot of people who don't have Wagner syndrome, so they don't have the Wilms tumor and the aniridia, but they have like developmental delay. And so somebody out there ran a, a test. And so they're starting to find people with just isolated BDNF um, loss. So I think that there may be, you know, quite a varying number depending on who you're selecting for. But I would say on average, about two thirds, a half to two thirds, depending on, you know, like what population you're looking at. So in order to, to do this, um, the best way is probably um, using a CGH microarray. And most, um, most insurance companies will cover this. Um, if they don't, you know, we, you know, on a research basis can enroll people to, to participate to get this kind of genetic testing done. Um, but the difficult part is we don't do it in a CLIA fashion. So it's technically not something that, that's supposed to go back into the chart. Um, there are all these caveats about that. Like we're really supposed to, I, I, I had a CLIA lab in the, at the NIH, but I don't now. So like basically I only can do it for research. So I can oftentimes you know, tell you the result that's technically not even supposed to go in the chart because it's a research test. However, I will say that, you know, I looked at prices recently and most commercial places, even if your insurance won't cover it, it's roughly about $500 out of pocket, which is very expensive. I'm not saying that that's, but it's much better than it used to be. It was in the thousands before. So I think it's not as prohibitive now if one really had to. But I think if, if you need to have insurance cover it, I think you just have to appeal it a few times and usually it will get covered. Okay, thank you. 
And then I'm going to touch on an older wagger, my child. It looks like it's uh, Andrea saying hi. Uh, Irma is now 34 years old. And the question is of uh, psych. Have you found escalation in emotional or psych issues as wagger children get older? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, this is where, uh, you know, I think the research is just limited in the sense that we, there just are not as many, you know, patients and we haven't followed people out longer. Um, but I think that um, one of the things I did notice, you know, sort of like, you know, in, in older individuals is that, um, you know, people who are adults, you know, they, they have adult needs, they have adult concerns. And I think that um, because of the nature of Wagner syndrome and the way we, we you know, care for people is that um, the relationship of sort of parent child kind of persists kind of long term. And so I think it's really important when you're making planning for transitioning into adulthood. Um, so I, you know, I haven't, uh, you know, I apologize. I haven't, you know, talked to you know, to Irma's family recently to understand, you know, the newest things. But when I hear this, the thing I'd be concerned about would be things like depression and anxiety needing to be treated because um, it's, it's hard. You know, I think that when you are an adult with adult needs and yet you have to be cared for in a situation that's much more similar to a caregiver child kind of relationship, you can see how this could foster, um, you know, some some difficulties and I think those need to be addressed and so I think I don't know that it's a progression of the disease because I, I think it's stable I think what's what what is developed through your genetics and through your development um, in utero it, it, during you know the development of the child um, those those things are, are stable but what changes over time is that people um, you know people age and people grow and their needs change and if we don't adapt to this and we always treat someone like a child naturally I mean I, I would feel you know, pretty, I would have a hard time too. Like, you know, if I didn't have autonomy and if I didn't have the ability to, to have the independence that I wanted to. So I, I think that that would be the, the main thing I would really advocate for is counseling and a really good psychiatrist and, you know, a team to, to support the needs of an adult who still needs help with, with care. All right, great, thank you. Um, so we do have a lot more questions here, uh, Dr. Han, but uh, to be respectful to your time and so we get moving forward, would you mind if I emailed you some of those? So oh, yeah, no, that would be fine. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I thank really you. appreciate it. And again, for your ongoing support of our association. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for all your support. All right. So as we move forward, um, and again, I, I do want to point it out, Dr. Han mentioned it. She did provide us a very valuable in-depth presentation on our research. It's more geared towards physicians and researchers, um, but it's very comprehensive. And I would say for me, my daughter, who will be uh, seven soon, uh, it was really the first time I've, I've heard a physician uh, or been around a physician who just seemed to know about all the various conditions and complexities with which our children may or may not encounter. Uh, and this video will be available uh, through a YouTube link, which she did provide through here quickly. We'll get it out to you guys. But we'll also have that video uh, posted on our, our new redesigned website. Uh, again, it'll still be Wagger or just uh, redesigned somewhat. So moving on, uh, let's, let's pull up where we're at in the presentation. Uh, as you'll see here, our next presenter is our very own Kelly Trout. Kelly Trout is a co-founding member of the IWSA and is currently serving as the chairperson for the IWSA Board of Directors. She also serves as the director of the Research and Medical Advocacy Committee. And Kelly assists families and physicians with questions about diagnosis and treatment of Wagger and other related disorders. She is also the pro program manager for the IWSA Patient Registry, and has written numerous articles on Wagger syndrome for many publications. Today, she is going to be discussing some of the exciting Wagger syndrome research that is being done around the world right now. Hello, my name is Kelly Trell. I'm the Director of Research and Medical Advocacy for the International Wagger Syndrome Association. I'm really excited to talk with you about the recent advances in research on Wagger syndrome and how those advances can lead to better diagnosis, better treatment, and better health for our children. I'd also like to show you how the, the IWSA works to make these advances happen. 
Think of it as connecting the dots to get us all from here to there. Over the past several years, the IWSA has been working really hard to drive research on Wagner syndrome forward. We've learned that the best way to do this is to stay focused on our mission and to follow a careful strategy. I'm going to show you how our mission and strategy lead to research projects and how those research projects lead to better care in the here and now and to better lives for our children in the future. So first, the mission. As Sherry mentioned, the mission of the IWSA has three parts. Promoting awareness, stimulating research, and supporting families and, and patients. You'll notice that our mission does not involve direct funding of research, but rather stimulating research. So what does that mean? Well, as you probably know, research is very expensive. The IWSA is a small organization, and there's no way we could raise millions of dollars for research on all the different conditions that affect our children. The good news is we don't have to. In fact, there are lots of other things the IWSA can do to make research happen. And as it turns out, those other things are things that the IWSA is uniquely suited to do. So what are those other things? Well, the IWSA's greatest strength is in our community of patients and families. You can't have research without patients, right? The IWSA also plays a big role in identifying and connecting with researchers who are interested in the conditions associated with Wagner syndrome. Also, collaborating with other patient organizations like Anaridia Europe, Vision for Tomorrow and the Japan Wagner Syndrome Association, and many others, is also a critical part of stimulating research. By working together with other organizations, we can share information, form a larger and more effective network, and we can help each other to help all of our families. Funding is still fundamental, of course. The IWSA works with large organizations like PCORI, they give grants for scientific conferences, and also with private parent-led foundations like Wagger Warriors and Miranda's Mission. Organizations that focus their support for the IWSA on helping us to advance research. All of these relationships work together to make research happen. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the IWSA has a very deliberate plan for advancing research on Wagger. We have five main priorities. These are Wilms tumor, aniridia, research on the BDNF gene, an initiative called the Wagger Syndrome Center of Excellence Clinic, and the Wagger Syndrome Patient Registry. Let's start with Wilms tumor research. In 2018, the IWSA was awarded a grant of $50,000 from PCORI to conduct a scientific conference. We used this grant to bring together Wilms tumor researchers from around the world, along with a small group of parents of children with Wagner. The goal of the conference was to focus attention not just on Wilms tumor, but on how Wilms tumor affects children with Wagner syndrome. The conference was a huge success. Researchers learned a lot from each other and from the parents. And as a result, a whole variety of research projects were launched. Take a good look at the faces in this photo because you're going to see many of them in the next few slides. Two of the researchers who attended the conference were Dr. Andrew Murphy and Dr. Peter Ehrlich. Dr. Murphy is currently working on a project that hopes to use information learned from Wagner Wilms tumors to improve treatment for a form of Wilms that is very hard to treat. Dr. Murphy also met Dr. Hahn at the conference, the doctor we just heard from. Together, they are looking at DNA samples taken from patients who participated in the NIH study of Wagner syndrome to see whether it may be possible in the future to predict which patients with Wagner syndrome will develop Wilms tumor. 
Dr. Ehrlich has recently completed a project that looked at the safety and effectiveness of partial nephrectomy, or removing only part of the kidney, in children whose Wilms tumor is a part of a syndrome like Wagger. His team found that their approach was safe and effective and allowed for more healthy kidney tissue to be preserved. Dr. Ehrlich's other project involves studying the genetics of bilateral Wilms tumor, which is when Wilms occurs in both kidneys at the same time. As many of us know, bilateral Wilms tumors are a special concern in Wagger syndrome. I'm very happy to tell you that this project just received funding from the Children's Oncology Group. This is a photo of Dr. Jana Hole a physician you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, and Adam Gunkel, president of the family foundation, Wagger Warriors. Adam was part of the delegation of Wagger parents who toured the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology in the Netherlands last summer to meet with researchers like Dr. Hull and explore ways that we can help them with their work. Dr. Hull attended the 2018 conference and in a little while, she's going to describe for you the results of the project she's been working on and will soon publish. This is a photo of Vicki Huff and her colleague, Christy Rutzhauser. Vicki also attended the 2018 conference. She is leading an incredibly exciting project that involves using mice to understand how Wilms tumor develops in children with Wagner syndrome and possibly even how to prevent it from developing in the first place. I'm gonna let her describe it to you though, because she's with us today and she's going to be presenting next. These two gentlemen are Dr. Fred Hoffer and Dr. Jeff Dome. Both have been involved in Wilms tumor research for many years and both attended the 2018 conference. Dr. Hoffer has been studying the problem of how to tell the difference between a nephrogenic rest, which is a mass in the kidney that may or may not need treatment, and a Wilms tumor. He recently published the results of his study, and his article will help doctors around the world to see the differences in these tumors more clearly. Many of you may recognize Dr. Dome, or you may have heard his name. That's because he's consulted on many cases of Wilms tumor in our children over the years. Dr. Dome recently wrote a chapter on Wagner syndrome for a medical textbook called Management of Genetic Syndromes. This chapter, written for doctors by a doctor who really understands Wagner syndrome, is another great step forward in getting better care for our kids. And here are two more physicians who attended the 2018 conference, Dr. Norbert Groff and Dr. Mari Vanden Heuvel Ibrink. Dr. Groff is a member of the International Society for Pediatric Oncology, or SIOP. Dr. Groff reports that SIOP has changed the way they manage children with Wagner syndrome and Wilms tumor by providing consultation to local doctors. This means that local physicians will have access to the best information on appropriate treatment. Dr. Vanden Heuvel Ibrink shared what she learned at our conference with researchers at another con conference she attended soon after in Japan. This resulted in those new and very hopeful research projects that Madoka of the uh, Japan Wagner Syndrome Association told you about a little while ago. And finally, in terms of Wilms tumor, representatives of the IWSA and Wagger Warriors met in London last summer with physicians and researchers at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Just like our meeting with researchers in the Netherlands, the goal was to build relationships and create partnerships to drive research on Wilms and Wagger syndrome. This whole team was really excited about the work that's being done around the world and how they can be involved. We hope to return next year to keep that ball rolling. Okay, so you've heard a lot about Wilms tumor. What about aniridia? Well, research on aniridia has been heating up and is becoming very productive too. 
NREDIA Europe is doing an absolutely stellar job of facilitating research. And the IWSA is working hard to make sure the whole community of patients and families are informed about this research and able to benefit from the information. We're also going to hear from Doc, Dr. Alex Levin today, who you can see here with Miranda Morris. Dr. Levin will be talking about diagnosis and treatment of complications of aniridia. This is a photo of a scientific symposium on aniridia that was hosted by the University of Virginia just this past November. This conference was attended by aniridia experts and researchers around the world and by representatives of the IWSA and several other patient organizations. Sharing information in this way, building on existing projects, and creating new partnerships and new collaborations is creating an explosion of new research on aniridia. And over the next year or so, I believe we're going to see some fantastic progress in our knowledge and in options for treatment. The third focus of research for the IWSA is the BDNF gene. As Dr. Joan Hahn explained earlier, about 50% of children with Wagner syndrome have only one copy of this gene instead of two, and this can have profound effects on them. Our hope is that continuing to stimulate research on this gene will lead to treatment for those effects and to better health for our kids. This is a photo of the core group of folks from the IWSA and from Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. We're working together on creating a special clinic just for families of children with Wagner syndrome. This clinic is all about creating a place for kids and adults with Wagner to come and receive world-class care from specialists who really know about Wagner syndrome. But it's also about more than that. It's about research. There is still so much we don't know yet about Wagner. But when it's up and running, this clinic will be the hub of worldwide learning and information about this disorder. COVID-19 has postponed the launch of the Center of Excellence Clinic, but this group has not stopped working on it, and the IWSA will keep you posted as we go along. Okay, I've told you about a lot of exciting and hopeful research, but this is the single most important project of all, the Wagner Syndrome Patient Registry. If you're not familiar with the registry, it's simply an online questionnaire about your child's medical conditions and history. It is the most powerful tool we have for advancing research on Wagner. It provides the actual data that researchers need to learn more about this disorder. The patient registry is so important, we've decided to launch a whole campaign to educate our families about it and to encourage everyone to participate in it. Please watch your email and the IWSA Facebook pages in the coming weeks for more information. Next up, you're going to hear from Dr. Jennifer Kalish, who's going to talk about how her team of researchers are using the Wagner Syndrome Patient Registry to learn things that will help all of our children. And that, my fellow parents and Wagner families, is how we get from here to there. By working together with your help, we can drive research on Wagner Syndrome forward. Thank you. Right, Kelly, thank you so much. It's truly inspiring, and I always look forward to these updates. It's so encouraging to see the progress we are making in research on Wagner syndrome. Next up, we're going to uh, have Vicki Huff come on, but I wanted to uh, just look at the agenda for a couple of moments. Uh, so Dr. Vicki Huff from MD Anderson will be next, followed by Dr. Yana Hall, and followed by Dr. Kalish and Dr. Levin. We are um, running a little bit over time. I hope everyone's really appreciating the contact, 
we do probably have about 40 more minutes of presentation. So I hope, um, I hope everyone has time to stay on. Again, I really want to take that great picture. Uh, for anyone who feels like they cannot stay on, just a reminder, we will send the video out for the full conference to you as well. So I am now pulling Dr. Huff up. Dr. Huff is a geneticist professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She um, has attended both of our Wilms Tumor and Wagger Syndrome conferences. And today she's gonna to be discussing some of her exciting research. Hi, Dr. Huff, how are Hi. you? <laughs> I'm fine. Um, and I just wanna point out Dr. Huff has also graciously agreed to stay on to answer any questions as well. And I remind you to please pose those questions within the Q&A section. Thank you very much. Dr. Huff, it's all Okay. Yours. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit nervous. Let me make sure I can share screen. Um, I did this for a family virtual 4th of July reunion. There. Okay. Great. I can do it again. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. There. All right. So first of all, I'm really delighted to be participating in virtual family meeting. And I want to thank everybody for the invitation and especially John for making this possible. Um, he and I did this little trial thing, and um, although I'm still a little bit nervous. So I'm gonna be talking to you about a project that we started recently, and I wanna mention from the onset, this was, we started it with the very generous support of the Wagger Warriors. Um, and this is basically using a mouse model that we created about 10 years ago um, to explore alternative patient care options, and I'll get to what I mean by that in just a second. First of all, I want to uh, recognize Christy Rudishauser. She's been working with me for decades um, and is an important aspect, an uh, important person in this project. And then also Nikki Williams, who also is playing um, an incredible role in terms of helping make sure our, our mice stay um, the, the mouse colony is managed appropriately. And then you'll recognize um, Kelly and Sherry. This was taken when they visited Houston back in um, February. So, okay, so um, I was asked to share a little bit of background about myself. Um, I got my PhD in human genetics at the University of Michigan, and I went to the human genetics department because I was really interested in how uh, genetics and genetic variants, genetic abnormalities uh, play a role um, and result in human disease. I did my dissertation actually <laughs> on herpes simplex virus um, for uh, reasons I won't go into, but again, it, within this department. And but at the time that I was doing this work, cancer and cancer pre genetic predisposition to cancer and cancer genetics was really becoming um, a hot item in the scientific community. And I became very interested in, in doing this. So as a postdoc, I went down to MD Anderson and began working on a project on the familial predisposition to Wilms tumor. I stayed at MD, I joined the faculty there, and my research focus included uh, doing molecular analyses of Wilms tumor patients, families, uh, the tumors from Wilms tumor patients, including WAGR patients. Uh, we created mouse models for human disorders that result in WT1 gene deletions. And kind of um, as an aside, as a sort of a, a fortuitous development, we also created a, a really neat mouse model for uh, liver carcinoma. Um, and I got involved in this group because I was asked to participate back in 2017 and also 18 symposiums on Wilms tumor in WAGR syndrome that were held in Ann Arbor. And the second one in particular, which has been mentioned previously in this, this meeting, was really a catalyst for some ideas of perhaps how uh, basic science researchers like me could get involved and do some things, not only to understand tumor development, but to directly work to help improve patient care. And so this has been um, a really exciting project for me, and I'm, I'm really very pleased that um, I'm able to do this. So 
Um, the project is basically we want to assess the ability of an IGF-2 pathway inhibitor to reduce the tumor incidence in this Wilms tumor mouse model that we created. IGF-2 stands for insulin growth factor 2. Um, oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, and I'll tell you slightly more about this later, but is it is the um, name implies it's a fetal mitogen that is important in terms of growth. And we also now know that it's important in terms of the development of Wilms tumor and many other tumors. So you all know that in WAGR, children carry one copy of WT1. They also carry one copy of PAC6 and other genes. Uh, I'm focusing on WT1 because again, this is the gene whose um, loss is results in the predisposition to Wilms tumor. These children also have congenital anomalies and about half of children will develop Wilms tumor. Um, these tumors, both work that we did a long time ago and other investigators did, we know that in these tumors, the one good copy that children have in their germline, this one good copy gets mutated, it gets inactivated in the tumor, and that this is an important step in the development of the tumor. And we also know that um, independent of uh, genes on 11P13, that these tumors in WAGR children and also other Wilms tumor patients often, not always, but often have a mutation that results in the increased expression of this fetal growth factor gene IGF-2. So our mouse model, which we published on about 10 years ago, basically incorporates very uh, nicely, and it was designed to do this, um, the features that we see in tumors from WAGR children. So the mouse carries a germline deletion of one copy of WT1. It also has a WT1 gene that is um, constructed such that it's usually normal. It acts, it's totally functionally normal. But if we treat the animals with tamoxifen, that gene then is inactivated. And I won't go into the details of this. It's really kind of neat um, mouse genetic recombination technology that I'm just taking advantage of but I won't go into the details of that unless people are interested. Um, and then also these mice carry a mutation in IGF-2 that results in increased expression of IGF-2. So you can see that then when we treat, for, well, first of all, when we do, if we do not treat the animals with tamoxifen, these mice are normal with the exception of they are slightly bigger than other mice. Well, about 20% bigger than other mice. But in terms of tumor development, they're normal. In terms of other developmental anomalies, they are normal. However, if in utero we treat the, uh, the fetuses with tamoxifen, tamoxifen, this knocks out this uh, WT1, the one remaining WT1 gene. And if we do this, ultimately about 90% of mice will develop Wilms tumor within a year. And I should mention this is both predominantly bilateral tumors. So you, we, as I mentioned previously, this mouse model really re replicates the genetic alterations that are important in tumor development and that are observed in um, the tumors of WHER children. Okay, so um, here, Thinking about it, WT1 is a difficult gene to target in terms of therapy. However, as I mentioned, we have this IGF2 pathway that children have, um, the tumors have a mutation that results in increased expression of this. We've engineered at the mice to have the same increased expression. And so we know that this pathway is frequently upregulated in tumors from WAGR children, and it's also upregulated in the WT1 IGF2 mice. And so the hypothesis is that if we can give these mice an IGF2 pathway inhibitor that downregulates this pathway now, that it will reduce the incidence of tumors in WAGR children. Um, and 
this actually, there's a, an inhibitor that was identified by Dr. Jeff Dome. Um, so we're following up on, on, on this idea of his. So, but the, the thought is, is that before it gets tested in children in a clinical trial, it really needs to have, a, this compound needs to be fairly, further vetted by testing it in mice. And that's what we're doing. So, this is just a graph of our mouse data that mice, wild type mice, or this mouse model that does not have, uh, is not given tamoxifen, they have no tumors. However, if when you give the mice tamoxifen, and so you inactivate the one remaining WT1 gene, that again, that um, about 90% or so of the mice develop Wilms tumor. And so the hypothesis then is, if we treat these mice with this IGF2 pathway inhibitor, the hypothesis is that we would reduce tumor development. So, and again, if then we observe this in the mice, this would provide, we think, compelling data for assessing this compound's tumor chemopreventative action in WAGR children. So we, as I mentioned, um, funds from the Wagger Warrior Foundation allowed us to start this. I want to give you now um, an update of the project. Um, and particularly, I was asked to comment about how the coronavirus pandemic has affected our research. Um, so um, bottom line is, yes, it has affected it. Um, back in the, toward the 20th of March, MD Anderson shut down all animal breeding. And two days later, all research labs were shut down. I was not allowed to go in to work. Most people in the department, most researchers in the institution were not allowed to go into work. However, um, some people in the genetics department were allowed to co go in to monitor animals. They could not do any lab work, but they could monitor animals. And Christy was one of the 11 that was able to do this. In mid-May, we were allowed to resume our animal breeding, but the labs were still closed, so we couldn't genotype the mice. And I won't go into gory details of this, but we basically, we could be breeding mice, but we didn't know which mice had the correct genotype for our studies. In uh, the 1st of June, fortunately, um, MD Anderson allowed research labs, at least in my building, to open um, on a half-day shift basis. Now all of the research labs in different buildings are now on this half-day shift basis. So Christy works morning, I work evening, we sort of tag team things. Um, as a result of this, we can, we're now doing, able to do the mouse breeding and the genotyping work can resume, so we're able to get back up to speed. So currently, what we're doing is we um, had all these experimental animals back in, in January and February and March that then we had to shut down breeding. So we find ourselves in a position of not, of needing to replenish our stock of young animals so to, in order to breed these experimental animals. Um, we're getting there. We've also recently ramped up the generation of experimental animals. Um, again, this now that we can do the genotyping, this is we're, in a, we're, al we're able to do this. And we do have a small cohort of we have not treated with this compound, and they are developing tumors. So um, this is reassuring to us that the, the model is working. Um, everything is is going as as expected we hope to have to start treating a cohort of experimental animals um, maybe by the end of the summer first of the fall um, we're hoping that this is um, this is our target we're hoping the mice will cooperate uh, such that we can get there and then once we have these experimental animals we will be uh, comparing the tumor incidence in animals not treated with this compound and then animals with treated, treated with this compound. And we'll be monitoring them for tumor development for one year. Um, very recently, 
we, and this gets into genetics, and I won't again go into the gory details, but just to say that the animals, the experiment animals that we have to breed, we have to put in this um, allele that's called Cree. And it usually gets transmitted from the father of the experimental animals. And usually these fathers, these males are heterozygous. So they, they transmit it to half their children, but they also have to transmit another allele to their offspring. So bottom line is usually with these matings to get experimental animals, we only get the appropriate genotypes 25% of the time. However, last week we identified what we call a super pre-male. So this is a, a, a mouse that, a male mouse that is now homozygous for this pre allele. And so now he will transmit it to transmit it to all of his progeny. He will transmit the other allele to half of the progeny. But the bottom line is it's instead of having just 25% of animals that we breed being the appropriate ones have the appropriate genotype. Now half of the animals will be um, the appropriate genotype. So we're excited about this. Um, this super pre male uh, we've got working overtime. In fact, I'm going in later this afternoon to put him together. So with some females um, and have him do his thing and be getting uh, more and more of these experimental animals bred. So I just want to um, solicit questions here. And then also thank you guys very much for your support and your encouragement. I also want to re, um, sort of back up a statement that, that Kelly was making in terms of the IWSA not funding research, but providing support to research. And she mentioned, and it was a, a really a catalyst for my work, she mentioned this meeting, the meetings that we had in Ann Arbor. But I also want to mention, for example, that I have put in some grant proposals to fund this work. And um, some of the comments that I have gotten back in the past were, well, this is great, this is really exciting, except there's no way this can go and result in a clinical trial because these patients are just so rare. And um, Sherry and um, Kelly provided information about ways in which researchers are developing techniques for doing clinical trials in very small populations. And with that information, I was able to incorporate that in um, to a grant proposal that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty um, optimistic about. Um, so anyway, thank again, thank you for your support and your encouragement. And I will um, let you, I, I'm going to stop shares. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Huff. That was, um, okay. that was great. And thanks for that, that last bit of information. I think that's really important. I do have a few questions on here I can read to you. I guess uh, one person wanted to know how many uh, wagger mouse, mice you had now. Um, although I feel like you answered that Oh, um, so that we've at, so the ones that we've got and um, we're monitoring them, but, but again, we haven't. Um, these are untreated mice. I'd say we have about ten or fifteen of those. Okay. And, but we've, and we've 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 intentionally wanted to wait until we really had ramped up getting the mice um, to start the treatment, so we can basically treat. Um, a lot of mice, um, and this has to do with sort of the um, logistics of giving them this compound, um, et cetera. Okay. And it, are the majority of the mice developing bilateral tumors or do they develop nephrogenic mice? Yeah, okay. yeah, most of them do. And then one more question, I guess, and then we'll move along. Um, how do you share your research with other professionals? Well, I publish things in the literature. Uh, things are presented at meetings. Um, so, for example, this mouse model was published in the Journal of Clinical um, um, Investigation back in 2010, I think. We've also actually, and I just sort of touches a little bit on some of the other phenotypes that are observed in WAGR. Um, we also, using kind of a a little bit different approach, we were able to, and we published this back in 2006, um, show again the importance of the WT1 gene in terms of genitourinary development. And so if we knock out the 
one remaining WT1 gene in the Sertoli cells of the kidney, um, Sertoli cells of the, of the testis, that these mice do have um, this sort of intersex uh, phenotype um, and some of the similar features uh, that are sometimes observed in WAGR children. Thank you. Thank you. We really look forward to your future updates. I look forward to being able to provide them to you. Thank you very much again for, for inviting Thank you for me. Your time. All right. So our next presenter is Dr. Yana Hall. Dr. Hall received her medical degree in 2015. And in 2016, she started her research project on genetic predisposition in childhood renal tumors as a PhD candidate slash clinical researcher at the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology in the Netherlands. Yana, like Vicki Huff, attended both of the Wilms Tumor and Wagger Syndrome conferences. And today she will be providing info on her research study. Hello and welcome. My name is Nana Ho and I'm going to present our study on Wilms tumor in 43 children with Wager syndrome, which is a study performed by the Cyoprenal Tumor Study Group. In this photo, you can see me together with Sherry and Kelly when they came to visit our hospital, uh, the Princess Maxima Center in Utrecht. Wilms tumor is a childhood kidney tumor which normally occurs in about 1 in 10,000 children. Uh, in children with Wager syndrome, the risk is much higher, around 1 in 2 develop Wilms tumor. Uh, in this presentation, I will also be talking about nephrogenic rests or nephroblastomatosis, which are areas of embryonic kidney tissue that fail to develop normally. They are considered Wilms tumor precursor lesions and they have the potential to become Wilms tumors. The aim of this study uh, was to learn more about Wilms tumor in children with Wager syndrome. And for this study, we used the International Registry of Children with Wilms tumor, which uh, registered children from Europe and some South American countries. Between 1989 and 2019, almost 8,000 children with Wilms tumor were registered. We selected children who were registered to have aniridia, and we contacted local physicians to confirm the Wager diagnosis. When we contacted these local physicians, we also asked them to complete an additional data collection form, which looked like this. Um, but because uh, many patients were treated many years ago, um, these physicians were not always able to complete uh, all the information. Uh, out of the 43 patients we identified, there were 18 boys and 25 girls from 12 different countries. When we look at the Wilms tumor diagnosis, then uh, they were diagnosed at a median or average age of 22 months with the youngest patient uh, diagnosed with Wilms tumor at the age of six months and the oldest patient at three and a half years. The Wilms tumors were detected by surveillance imaging in most cases, but still 12 patients were symptomatic at their diagnosis. Looking at disease stage, then information was available for 40 patients. 25 of them had unilateral Wilms tumor, which means that one kidney was affected. 15 patients had bilateral Wilms tumors, so both kidneys were affected. Uh, and this percentage is much higher when compared to patients who do not have Wager syndrome. Note that uh, these 15 patients include five patients who had bilateral nephroblastoma. Metosis, meaning that they had precursor lesions uh, and not the actual Wilms tumors. Uh, disease spread to other organs, which is known as metastatic disease, did not occur. 
when we look at treatment, uh, then uh, pre-operative chemotherapy was administered uh, to 93% of all patients. And this is related to the SIOP protocol, uh, which is different from North American protocols. For 34 patients, we also knew what type of surgery they had. And 16 of them had nephron sparing surgery, which means that only part of the kidney was removed. This is uh, not always possible, but depends on the size and location of the tumor. After surgery, uh, the pathologist uh, examines the tumor under the microscope and determines the histological subtype. And this information was available for 42 patients. As you can see, six patients had nephroblastomatosis only and never developed a Wilms tumor. And a total of 19 patients had stromal Wilms tumor, which is a Wilms tumor subtype uh, that is typically related to Waker syndrome and other WT1 gene abnormalities. Uh, upon careful examination, almost 80% of uh, all patients had nephrogenic rests alongside the Wilms tumor. If we look at the outcomes after treatment, then none of the tumors relapsed. However, 2 out of 25 patients with unilateral Wilms tumor went on to develop Wilms tumor in the other kidney one in seven years after their initial diagnosis. Both of these patients were alive and disease-free at last follow-up. Three out of five patients with bilateral nephroblastomatosis went on to develop Wilms tumors. And all three of them were also alive and disease-free at last follow-up. Overall, four patients died. Uh, as a result of treatment complications, which included liver failure and intestinal obstruction. We also tried to collect information about kidney failure later in life, and this was available for 20 patients. Five out of these 20 patients had signs of kidney failure based on urine analysis within 2 to 13 years after their Wilms tumor diagnosis. One patient even required dialysis or transplantation at the age of 16 years. Uh, because our follow-up was limited, it's important to mention that we know from previous studies that about half of individuals with Baker syndrome develop kidney failure at some point in their lives. So what do these results mean for children with Baker syndrome? Uh, we think uh, our study demonstrates that if a child with Wager syndrome develops Wilms tumor, both kidneys are frequently affected. There's a low risk of disease spread outside the kidney and a low risk of recurrent disease. However, some patients go on to develop new tumors and treatment complications need to be monitored even more carefully than for patients who do not have Wager syndrome. Uh, and taken together, that means that patients with Baker syndrome need to be treated by expert teams. While this study is now completed and about to be published, um, we are aware of ongoing research worldwide, uh, which is important to improve the care for patients with Baker syndrome. For example, studies that are looking into ways to prevent the progression, uh, progression of nephroblastomatosis to Wilms tumor. And studies that are based on the parents' registration uh, to get a more complete picture of all aspects that are involved uh, with Wager syndrome, not just the Wilms tumors. With that, I would like to thank this uh, long list of physicians who helped to collect all the information for this study, and in particular, my supervisors, who from left to right are uh, Roland Kuiper. Um, standing next to me is Marjolein Jongmans, who's a geneticist, and on the right is Marie van der Heuvel, who's a pediatric oncologist.
All right, thank you, Yana, for all your hard work and collaborative efforts related to Wilms tumor research. We're down to our last two presentations, Dr. Jen Kalish, and then finally, Dr. Alex Levin. Uh, I please ask that you all stay on patiently. Both presentations are well worth it. I also wanna remind you that any questions we have not addressed yet, we will get to you um, either live or again through email after the, the presentation within the next few days. So our next presenter is Dr. Jen Kalish. Uh, she is a clinical geneticist and physician scientist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Her work focuses on beckwith weidemann syndrome and disorders of growth and genetic cancer predisposition. BWS, similar to Wagner syndrome, is a rare condition where patients are predisposed to developing Wilms tumor. She directs the beckwith weidemann syndrome clinic at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the beckwith weidemann syndrome program of excellence through the Orphan Disease Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kalish has been analyzing the data of our patient registry and will be providing some preliminary findings. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about some of the work we've done in terms of phenotyping um, and characterizing Wagner syndrome. So initial work was done back in 2005 by a different group that was looking to understand both the classic and non-classic clinical manifestations of Wagner syndrome, both in terms of diagnosis, evaluation, and clinical management. That initial study looked at over 50 patients um, ranging in age from seven months to four years and reviewed both hospital records and asked parents to complete a survey of specific characteristics, and they came up with a bunch of recommendations for Wagner syndrome. Now, we were asked, in collaboration with the um, Wagner Association, to look at the data from the Wagner syndrome patient registry that was initially conceptualized in 2012 in cooperation with the Global Rare Disease Registry, and then further launched um, by Kelly Trout and the Medical Advisory Board of the Association back in 2015. Now, this understanding how a patient registry works is complicated because you both need ways to protect the data, have consent forms so families consent, can consent into the research, and then spread the information about the registries present to the families involved. The platform used for um, this registry was the coordination of rare disease is at Stanford or CORDS at the Stanford Health System. And the way this registry works is that families could enter data based on a family um, patient-based survey or family reported survey, including about 70 questions that they could answer. And then researchers could access de-identified data through an application process to understand more about um, patients and propose a specific study for, um, to use the data in the registry. So we were approached by Kelly Trout and John Morris to look at the registry data and try and understand more about the expanded phenotype of that. In order to do this, we, we applied and re received access to the data. There were um, almost 200 responses from 131 participants, and then we had to decide within those what the criteria were for inclusion. There were some patients that didn't appear to be diagnosed with aniridia or Wagner syndrome, so we needed to remove those. There were several participants that did not complete the surveys, and what we ended up with was 85 patients that either had Wagner syndrome as their diagnosis, or they didn't select a diagnosis, but they had aniridia plus a key feature of Wagner. And in 16 cases, they just selected aniridia. So looking more closely at this cohort, there were 85 patients. There was more females than males. There was a, it was mostly a Caucasian um, demographic, and the ages ranged from three months to 46 years, while most of the patients were on the younger end. There was one patient that was deceased due to complications of Wilms tumor, but most of the patients were, um, uh, all the other patients were alive to our understanding. 
Now here are the, looking at the classic features of um, Wagger syndrome, and just in light blue are the prior study results just to see how they compare to what we found. So we saw that 35 out of 70 four patients, or about 50% or so, had Wilms tumor, 100% had aniridia, um, general urinary abnormalities were found in about 65% of patients, and there was a range of delays in terms of development in about 90% of patients. And here's the breakdown of patients based on having just aniridia or one or more of these key features. Other features looking at more in depth were broken into several categories. So we have the ear, nose, and throat category where based on patients having um, sleep apnea or other issues that require ton tonsillectomies or adenectomies or um, ear tubes being placed. There was also about 50% of patients that had obesity and short stature. There was about a third of patients that had cardiovascular differences, um, about 20% to 30%, depending on which type of um, feature for kidney issues. There was a, about 50% of patients had an orthopedic issue, whether it was hypotonia or um, Achilles heel, Achilles tendon differences. There was about 40% that had an anxiety disorder and about 30% that had OCD in this group. In addition, in terms of sleep apnea, there were um, about 30% that had that, and about 50% reported less sleep than usual. There was also other findings, including involving ears differences. Um, there was a small percentage that had some brain differences. And then in terms of vision, there was a whole range of things, some of which were part of aniridia and some things that were independent of aniridia. And there's a whole laundry list of things here um, in terms of eye findings that were reported. Keep in mind, these are all patient-reported results. So in some cases, there, there could be things that actually we could combine categories, but we weren't sure because it was all based on the responses to the survey. One, uh, one thing I also wanted to note is that the data for gastrointestinal differences was not available in a format that we could use initially, and we, are, we actually just recently received that, so that's not included here, but there are some data to, to forthcoming on that. One thing that was different that we had more information about in this study compared to the previous one was there was 26 patients who were adults in this group. And looking at their health rating, that it looked like about half of them had a good health rating, and in nine, case, nine out of 24 had a very good health rating. So there was a range. Um, a little bit less than half graduated from high school. Very few lived independently, and most were still single and not married based on, and these were all based on the questions that were asked in the survey. So the recommendations that came out, that come out of looking at all this data are similar to what was pr presented in the 2005 paper with a couple slight differences. So it's important to assess children with sporadic aniridia for Wagger syndrome. A genetic testing is important. One of the challenges, which I'll get back to in a minute with this data, was that we didn't have genetic testing results for most of the patients. Uh, the next piece was Wilms tumor screening protocols. And based on the screening guidelines that I wrote actually in 2017, after reviewing all the, the clinically available data in the medical literature, was that we could screen for Wilms tumor up until the seventh birthday. However, there, it appears that there may be anecdotally a number of cases that are not reported in the medical literature of patients with Wilms tumors at a later time. And I'll get back to that in terms of future recommendations of, of additional things that we should potentially study to assess that more. It's important to assess for muscle skeletal abnormalities, sleep apnea, cardiac, and then behavioral and psychiatric disorders. There um, was something regarding um, females for streak ovaries and whether or not that was a, um, a change that was noted. It's important to um, educate caregivers on tumor screening and to encourage intervention services early. And it also discussed transitions to, to adulthood that are beyond the scope of the data we have here, but based on the fact that there are some lingering issues that move on to adulthood, it's something that needs to be studied further. 
the limitations of this study were that it was patient entered data and in some cases we had limited details or incomplete data. In most cases we did not have genetic testing results so we couldn't correlate a genetic testing result to a specific feature and most of the patients in the group still about two-thirds of them were, were actually younger patients so it'd be helpful to have more data on older patients so we can see how things move over time plus it would allow us to see a, a spectrum across the lifespan. So in conclusion, this work validated this, the findings that um, the 2005 paper showed and opened up some additional areas for further study. It's important to think that there's a range of clinical conditions that make up Wagger syndrome and that there may actually be a phenotypic spectrum of clinical features rather than just the specific features in the acronym for Wagger that we know. It's also important to think about genetic testing and education and what that means both in terms of clinical features and in terms of um, additional um, clinical interventions. We also at the moment would recommend following the AACR tumor screening guidelines, but it's clear that further study is needed specifically in Wagger syndrome. And we need to think about the anticipatory guidance related to issues of transition of adult care. Future directions boil down to one particular thing, which is that we need more data. This is a very rare disease and we need both information about many aspects of this, but the, particularly in terms of adult follow-up and tumor risk, we need to do more comprehensive studies and bring, come together as a rare disease community to really understand this. Um, we also need to consider in integrating comprehensive chart review to find to further delineate some of these self-reported issues and to understand more about genotype phenotype analysis, which means that we actually need to review the genotype and the genetic testing results to correlate that to the clinical features. But most importantly with all of this is we need to collaborate because the way to understand this, especially for a rare disease, is to work together to gather all of this data and to encourage people to join the registry and to join in additional studies that are being proposed to understand more about this. And my expertise in all of this really comes from my background studying another rare disease, which is back with Wiedemann syndrome, for which we have a comprehensive registry for these patients. And for BWS, we started this registry in 2014 to really understand the clinical and molecular aspects of BWS so we can improve care, both in children and adults. And this was the first registry to really comprehensively capture the spectrum we see in BWS patients. We've got hundreds of families from all over the world enrolled and it's basically a combination of clinical and molecular data where we're abstracting that from medical records for the most part. So we're able to correlate what families tell us into the very specific concrete nuanced details and look for correlations between the, gen the genetic findings and the clinical findings and bringing all that together. And it's open to all families with BWS. And one of the things that it sounds like the association is considering doing is something similar to this, where in addition to the survey-based approach to actually be able to do this more in depth so that we can all collaborate together to try and understand more about Wagger syndrome. And none of this would be possible without the um, support and engagement of the association and the CORDS registry group and I would like to thank my research team and um, the, um, the, some of the funding for this came through Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and every year there's a fundraising effort and I know there's a number of families that participated last year for this and there's, you can find more details at this link and finally the patients and their families because without you, there is no research to be done and, and we really need to understand how we can partner together to understand more about rare diseases like Wagger. And I thank you for your time and I'm happy to address any questions via um, the chat. So thank you, Dr. Kalish. We are uh, very excited for your continued analysis of our registry. And I do agree, we need more data to better understand our children and loved ones. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, Dr. Kalish thought she was gonna be able to be present here today and was looking forward to answering some of the questions. Uh, but she definitely said, and it looks like we have a really nice stream of questions through the Q&A. 
Uh, she did say she'd be available. So I'm going to forward any of those questions that are appropriate for her uh, to her. And certainly if you can think of any other ones you'd like her to answer, you can either put them in this thread. Uh, you could also email me. It's john.morris at wagr.org. All right. Our last presenter is Dr. Alex Levin. Dr. Levin is an ophthalmologist at Will's Eye in Philadelphia and is the chief of pediatric ophthalmology and ocular genetics. He also is a professor at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University. And for the last seven years, he's served as our daughter Miranda's ophthalmologist, providing exceptional care. Although it saddens me to say, and he'll say it in his uh, video, that he's moving very shortly to the Rochester, New York area to assume the role of Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Ocular Genetics at the Flam Eye Institute and Chief of Pediatric Genetics at Galisano Children's Hospital at U of R. Today, he will be discussing current recommended strategies to manage dry eye in aniridia. Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Levin, Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Ocular Genetics at Will's Eye Hospital. By the time you receive this video and this message from me, I'll actually be at the University of Rochester uh, playing the same role. But my role with Wager Syndrome will continue. And Wager Syndrome, as you know, is a disorder that affects multiple genes side by side on the 11th chromosome. One of those genes is called the Pax6 gene. That gene is involved with the disease called aniridia. Now, the title of this talk is The Cornea in Wager Syndrome, Keeping the Window Clean. I'm talking without slides because I think it's better for the Zoom type format just so that we can talk one to the other uh, on this chat. And I welcome you after this to send me any questions you may have. You can send them at A Levin, A L E V I N, at Will's Eye, W I L L S E Y E dot org. And that email will remain active after I switch from one role to the other. Why the cornea? Well, it turns out that aniridia is a misnomer. The word aniridia means without iris, but multiple parts of the eye are affected by this disease, this eye part of the Wager syndrome. Perhaps the most difficult to manage part of aniridia is the cornea. The cornea is the crystal covering of our eye, like a watch crystal on top of a watch. It's basically invisible. If you stood to the side of someone and looked, you'd see that dome, that arc that's covering the eye over the pupil, which is the cornea. The cornea is a crystal clear structure, an amazing work of nature that is kept clear by the health of its inside layer of cells called the endothelium, which pump fluid out of the cornea to keep the window clean all the time and allow crystal clear vision. But part of the cornea is the skin over its surface called the epithelium. That skin, so to speak, is a layer of cells that is constantly being renewed, kind of the most living part of the cornea on top of the surface. You might have heard of people who get their eyes scratched. When you get a scratched eye, that's when the epithelium, the cells, the skin on the surface of the eye, get cleared away. And as you know, they could get cleared away, very painful for adults, but it heals within 24 hours, perhaps one of the most rapidly healing parts of the human body. How does that happen? These cells, these epithelial cells, are generated by the edge of the cornea. So if you look at my eye right now, you see the colored part of my eye. And through the middle of that is my pupil, the black hole in the middle that lets light into the back of my eye. At the edge of the colored part of my eye is also the edge of my cornea. If you think of my watch, the edge of my watch crystal is the edge of the cornea. And that edge is where it attaches to the white of the eye. That zone, the zone where the clear part touches the white part 
is called the limbus. That's spelled L-I-M-B-U-S. The limbus is a very special area in the eye because it is the place that generates new cells to populate the skin on the surface of the eyeball. In order to do that, it needs a good copy of the PAC6 gene, actually two good copies. And we each have two copies of every gene in our body, but an aniridio, like all other autosomal dominant diseases, one copy is not working. And that's enough to make these limbal cells, or what we call limbal stem cells, unable to populate that skin and keep it healthy. You heard the word stem cell, and stem cell is an important word we read in the news and hear all the time. Stem cell simply means a cell in the body that has the ability to become other kinds of cells. All of us had stem cells when we were in the womb. Those are the kind of cells that generate the rest of the cells in our body. Some become liver cells, some become kidney cells, some become eye cells. And these cells on the limbus are the ones that become the epithelium, the surface covering of the eye. Without a healthy PAC6 gene, it's very hard for new cells to be generated. And what happens is that over time, this surface is unhealthy. And as it gets unhealthy, it allows blood vessels to grow into the cornea, which don't belong there. Normally, as I said, the cornea is crystal clear. If blood vessels are growing in, it starts to lose its clarity. The absence of the PAC6 gene is causing these limbal stem cells not to be healthy, to create a barrier for those blood vessels growing in. And when these blood vessels grow in, it makes the epithelium, the surface skin irregular, uncomfortable, painful sometimes, causing patients to squint because the light bothers them as it can't get through that very clear cornea that the rest of us have. This is a very, very difficult problem to treat. And again, I would think the most difficult problem in aniridia because we just don't yet have a good treatment, although help is on the way. One other problem that patients with aniridia have is that if they get a scratch on their cornea, unlike the rest of us where it is the rapidly healing part of the body, they can't generate the new cells to cover that little scratch. And a scratch could be there for a long, long time, weeks, months, I've seen it even years. And when there's a scratch, you're also prone to infection, what we call a corneal ulcer. And those infections can leave scars, they can even be blinding. So trying to maintain a clear window, trying to keep that cornea clear in the face of limbal stem cell deficiency, an inability to generate new cells is really the challenge in this disease. How do we do that? The number one and most foremost thing that we can do is lubrication. If you ask me, What's the prescription for a patient with aniridia? It's lubrication, lubrication, lubrication. And we do that with artificial teardrops or artificial tear ointments that your eye doctor uh, can point you to. Almost all of those are over-the-counter products. If you go into a pharmacy, you'll see scores of different products. We prefer preservative-free treatment, either in the form of drops or ointment. It's recommended that you use artificial tears three or four times daily. And when problems are getting worse or there's more difficult or more discomfort, which is often worse in the morning because our eyes dry out a bit while we're sleeping due to the lack of blinking, in that case, you might want an artificial tear ointment before bedtime to help lubricate the eye during sleep. It has been shown that lubrication can retard the development of problems. Um, whether it's going to stop getting those blood vessels in completely uh, is hard to say, but we do know that kids who use these kinds of preparations do do better and do have less symptoms. What do we do when things start to progress and they keep going and going and lubrication is not enough? One thing we can do is use what's called serum eye drops. These are eye drops that are actually made from the patient's blood or in the case of children, sometimes from their parents' blood. 
the blood is drawn, it's spun down in a certain machine to separate the cells, the red cells, the white cells of your blood, from the liquid portion of your blood called the serum. And eye drops are manufactured from that uh, serum, custom made, that are used usually four times a day. These seem to bring healthy juices, so to speak, to help those stem cells live a better life and perform better. And that can actually rapidly improve patients who have abrasions, what we call corneal epithelial defects, and maybe help maintain a better sense of lubrication and health for the limbal stem cells. What's the next step? Well, some patients really have chronic problems. The blood vessels are growing in, they get these abrasions, they get these little defects in the skin of the eye. Nothing that goes through inside to the eye, it's just a very superficial layer, but it can be quite troubling. And then we have to start thinking about alternate treatments. One might be, for example, that we would uh, take a membrane, actually an amniotic membrane that are harvested from babies after birth, the sac that keeps the baby inside, those are taken and commercially generated into little thin strips that can be placed on the surface of the eye, kind of like a temporary covering. Uh, and there's many commercially available forms of that that dissolve over time or some that have to be put on and removed, different ways to do that. Uh, sometimes we even sew the eyelids shut to create a permanent or semi-permanent covering of the eye. So it's bathing in its own tears all the time. Sometimes little plugs are placed in the holes on the inside part of the eyelid where I'm pointing. That's where tears drain off the eye. And by putting a little plug in there, it causes a backup of the tears to make the surface of the eye moist. All of these are treatments designed to try to supplement the work of the limbal stem cells, to supplement the lubrication of the eye, and try and slow down, if not prevent, some of these problems that occur. Cornea transplant is the ultimate treatment for someone who has an opacified cornea. But the problem is that in aniridia, it's a very hard operation to do successfully. Number one, if blood vessels are already grown into the cornea, it's going to increase the chance of rejection because otherwise in a corneal transplant, the body doesn't know the new transplant is there. There's no blood vessels to feel that that new transplant is here, feel it chemically. The second problem is when you get a cornea transplant, you're getting from the donor all of the cornea except the skin. The skin comes from the patient. And we've already said that the skin is not forming well in aniridia, and therefore covering that transplant is a challenge as well. But the future has much to offer us. The idea of stem cell transplantation, putting healthy stem cells at that edge around the cornea is already here. The problem is, is that's donor cells and that requires getting medications to suppress your immune system to fight rejection of those cells chronically. And of course, there's side effects associated with that. New work done in part out of Georgia is showing a contact lens model of delivery of stem cells that's worked quite successfully in rabbits and will hopefully come to human use in the not too distant future. And lastly, we even have now in development an eye drop treatment for gene therapy, whereby putting a drop on the eye with the correct PAC6 molecule, or actually more accurately, with chemicals that help in some patients overcome the mutation in the gene so that their PAC6 gene will work well, that will allow the gene defect to be created and the limbal stem cells to work again. So there's much to happen in the future. Science is progressing quickly. I think 10 years from now, we're gonna be looking at a much different world than we are today for patients. But in the meantime, lubricate, lubricate, lubricate. I'm Dr. Alex Levin, happy to answer any questions at A Levin, A-L-E-V-I-N, at Willseye, W-I-L-L-S-E-Y-E dot org. And again, that email will remain active. 
I thank you very much for your time. Congratulations to the organizers on this fantastic conference, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Take care. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Levin. Um, you're certainly going to be missed. Um, so we're just about ready for the last picture. I'm hoping everyone will just stay on for a couple moments. There's just a few things I wanted to go over in regards to a couple of things. Uh, one of them, again, is the reminder that we will be having um, an updated website design. It'll still be at wagger.org. Uh, we do anticipate it being completed in the fall. And please be on the lookout for future communications for when the redesigned website is live. Uh, what we've also learned today is that there are medical professionals who are interested in accessing our registry. And the IWSA Wagger Syndrome Patient Registry is the largest collection of data on Wagger Syndrome patients worldwide. It's very exciting stuff. We currently have 91 Wagger patients enrolled in the IWSA Wagger Syndrome Patient Registry with 16 of those having updated their questionnaire in this past year. With such an incredibly rare disease, every single Wagger patient's information is critical in learning more about this disease and potentially how to manage it. To increase participation in the Wagger syndrome patient registry, the IWSA will be hosting a special initiative this month. You're going to be hearing a lot more about it starting next week. So please be on the lookout for lots of informative videos about the registry from our families, our doctors, and even our kids. And please, let me be the first of many this month to ask each of you to take the time to fill out or update our registry by August 30th. It really will make a huge difference in the lives of our kids. So again, thank you everyone. And again, I want to thank the Delta Gamma Foundation. When everyone leaves this meeting today, there will be a survey that pops up in your web browser, or it may already be there. Feedback is so helpful. We hope to continue doing these types of offerings, uh, providing more awareness, providing more education to our families. And again, I always appreciate the feedback, just so we always know we're going in the right direction. As a reminder, the video will be forwarded out to each of you. And it, again, will eventually be on the wagger.org website. And for those of you who had your questions and answers answered, uh, I, hope you pre I hope you had a good answer, uh, either live or written by one of our, um, our team. Uh, but any of those that were not answered, again, we will follow up via email. And then as, as Beth mentioned in the very beginning, uh, we're really excited that next year in July, we will be hosting Wagger Weekend in the United States in Philadelphia. And although we can't be here with you physically, we hope as many of you as possible will come here and join us. All right? All right, I am done sharing my screen. Uh, what I really want to do now is pull each of you up and let's take a really cool picture. All right, so as I'm pulling you up, you will have to access your video.